In this video I will show you one possible workflow for regression analysis. This workflow will address all the assumptions that are empirically testable after regression analysis. There are of course multiple different ways of testing the assumptions, but this is the way I like to do it. I'm using R for this example, but most of all of these tests and diagnostics can be done with data as well, and most of them can be done with SPSS. Regression analysis workflow and any, uh, and any other statistical analysis workflow first starts by stating a hypothesis that we want to test. Then we collect some data for testing the hypothesis. After that we explore our data. So it is important to understand the relationships. Then we estimate the first regression model where we have the independent variables and the dependent variable. Then we check the results briefly to see what they are like and we proceed with diagnostics. So the diagnostics include various plots and I prefer plots over statistical tests. The reason is that while you can for example do a test for heteroscedasticity, that test will only tell you whether there is a problem or not. It will not tell you the nature of the problem. It is much more uh, informative to look at the actual distribution of the residuals to see what is the uh, heteroscedasticity problem like. And also if you just look at uh, eyeball these graphs, you will basically uh, identify the same thing that the test tells for you. So I don't generally use tests unless someone asks me to, to do so. Then when I have done the diagnostics, I, I figure out what is the biggest problem. And once I have fixed the biggest problem, then uh, I go back to do a regression model. For example, I may identify that there are some nonlinear relationships that I didn't think of in advance or I might, may identify some outliers, or I may identify some heteroscedasticity. I go back to fit another regression model where I have fixed the problem, then I do diagnostics again, and once I'm happy, then um, I conclude that that is my final model after the diagnostics. I do possibly nested model tests against alternative models, and then comes the fun part. I, I interpret what the regression coefficients mean. So I don't just state that the regression coefficient is 0.02. I tell what it means in my particular research context. And uh, that is the hard part in regression analysis. To demonstrate the regression analysis diagnostics, we need some data. We're going to be using the prestige data set again. And our dependent variable is the prestige this time and we're going to be using education, income and share of women as independent variables. So that is a regression model. And uh, the regression estimates are here. We have gone through these estimates before in a, in a previous video, so I will not explain them in detail. Instead, I'm going to be focusing now on the assumptions checking. So how do we know that the six regression assumptions actually hold? The assumptions are shown here. The assumptions are that all relationships are linear. So it's a linear model. Observations are independent. So independence of observation comes from our research design and in cross-sectional study it is difficult to test. If you have a longitudinal study then you can do some checks for independence of observations. No perfect collinearity and non-zero variances of independent variables. That happens if two or more variables perfectly determine one another. So if you have a categorical variable of three categories then including three dummies leads to this problem because once you know two dummies you know the third value. Also no, no non-zero variance if you have zero variance for example if you are studying the effects of gender and uh, you have no women in the sample then you have no variance in gender. So that is another implication and another reason why this could occur. We know that this is not a problem in our data because if it was a problem we couldn't even estimate the regression model. Because we got regression estimates that indicates that we don't have problem with the third assumption. The uh, other assumptions are a bit more problematic because they are about the error term and we can't observe the error term. So the fourth assumption was the error term is expected value of zero given any values of independent variables then error term has equal variance, this is the homoscedasticity assumption, and then the error term is normally distributed. How we do test these assumptions about the error term, these three assumptions, is that we use the residuals as estimates of the error term. So if 
an observation is far from the regression line in the population, it has a large value of the error term, then uh, we can expect that it also has a large residual. So we can use the residuals as estimates of error terms. So normally doing regression diagnostics is analyzing the residuals. And that's quite natural because if you think that the residual is the part of the data that the model doesn't explain, and uh, the idea of diagnostics is that we check if the model explains the data adequately, then it's quite natural to look at the part of the data that the model doesn't explain for clues on what could, be, what could go wrong. I normally start with uh, the normal QQ plot of, of the residuals. And the normal QQ plot is uh, something that quantifies whether the regression uh, residuals are normally distributed. So it compares the, uh, the residuals here, or these are calculated, based on, uh, calculated uh, based on standardized residuals. There are different kinds of residuals. Uh, for an applied researcher, it doesn't really matter if we know them all. What's important is that uh, your software will calculate the right kind of residual for you automatically when you, when you do these plots. Then you have normal distributions where you're comparing residuals against normal distribution. We can see here that uh, they uh, roughly correspond. So we have a line here indicates that residuals are normally distributed. Here is a problem. Uh, we have a chi-square distributed error term here. So the residuals here are, are further from uh, mean than they're supposed to be. And here we have inverse, uh, we have uniform distribution of the error term and that creates this kind of S-shape in the, in the normal QQ plot. While the normality of the error term is not an important assumption in regression analysis, I nevertheless do this because it usually, uh, it's quick to do and it identifies outliers for me and it gives me kind of like a, a first look at the data. Here uh, with the actual data I can see that there are residuals follow normal distribution so I'm happy with this. This is an indication of uh, a good fitting model uh, on if we think they are the sixth assumption. R labels these possible outliers so newsboys has a large negative residual so newsboys is less prestigious than what the model predicts and farmers are more prestigious what the model predicts. So farmers don't make much money and you don't need high education to be a farmer but farmers are still appreciated a lot. So that's an, an uh, other extreme case. So normal QQ plot shows that the residuals are roughly normally distributed and that's a good thing. So we conclude no problems. Then we start looking at more complicated plots. The next plot is the residual versus fitted plot. And the idea of residual versus fitted plot is that it allows us to test for nonlinearities and heteroscedasticity in the data. So the fitted value is uh, calculated based on the regression equation. So we multiply these uh, variables with the regression coefficients and then we compare residual versus fitted. Ideally, there is no pattern here. There are residuals and fitted values, they are just spread out. So this is uh, an indication of a well-fitting model in this regard. Here we have a heteroscedasticity problem. So uh, that plot contains data where the variation of the residual and also the variation of the error term is uh, a lot less here in the middle and then it opens up to the left and to the right. So this is a butterfly shape of residuals and this is the worst kind of heteroscedasticity problem that you could have. But it's not very, very realistic because it's difficult to figure out, uh, difficult to think uh, what kind of process would generate this kind of data. Then here we have uh, a non-linearity and uh, some heteroscedasticity problem. So this is a megaphone opening right and it appears that there's slight non-linearity here. We have here severe non-linearity. So the right formula, right shape is not line, but it's a curve here. And uh, this is a, a weird looking data set that has a non-linearity problem. And also it has a heteroscedasticity problem. So the plot, we want to have something that looks like that, no particular pattern. So typically in these diagnostic plots, you that plot residual against something else, you are looking for a no pattern. Our residual versus fitted plot 
looks like that. So we have marked again these observations with high residuals in absolute value and then we can see that uh, we have fitted values. There are very few, uh, few professions for which the model predicts high prestigiousness and uh, most observations are between uh, 30 and 70. So what can we infer from this plot? We can infer that maybe the variance of the estimates decreases slightly to the right. So we don't have much observations here. So we don't know if this is actually uh, the same this person here, but we just observe two values from that this person. But it is possible that uh, if you look at this, uh, this person here, it's that much. And we look at this person here, it's uh, slightly less. So it is possible that we have a heteroscedasticity problem. So uh, the fifth assumption does not hold. Whether that is severe enough to warrant using the heteroscedasticity robust standard errors, that is a bit unclear because this is not, not a clear, uh, clear case of uh, where we should, should use those. Then we check for outliers. So this far we have been looking for evidence for heteroscedasticity and nonlinearity. We have found evidence for heteroscedasticity but not really for nonlinearities. Then we are looking for outliers as the final step using the fourth plot. And uh, the residual versus leverage plot tells us uh, which observations are influential. So we are looking here at uh, observations that have a high leverage and high residual. So we have uh, general managers who have high leverage and uh, a high residual in absolute value. So we want to look for observations with uh, residuals that are large in absolute value, absolute magnitude. In uh, Stata, for example, Stata uses the squared residual here because uh, that always goes up. So it's easier to see uh, which observations have large residuals. So we, can, we have to look at small negative values or large positive values here. So it's not as, as simple as if it was, if this was square of the residual. So minister has leverage, newsboys has uh, a large residual and then uh, general managers is uh, here. The Cook's distance is another measure of uh, influence and observations with large, large Cook's distance are potential outliers. As before, uh, in the Deep House paper, to deal with these outliers, we will be uh, looking at why the prestigiousness of one occupation would be different than others. So, for example, general managers uh, are they, they earn a lot of, lot of money, so their salaries are high, and therefore their uh, predicted prestigiousness should be high as well because it depends on the income, and uh, they earn less than what the model predicts, which means that the model uh, over predicts their prestigiousness because of the high income. So that could be uh, one reason why we, would, we could drop general managers. But you have to use your own, own judgment because this is only 102 observations. So dropping one observation increases our sample size uh, by 1% approximately. So that's, uh, that could be uh, consequential. So we have the leverage is at the distance from the mass center of the data conceptually and Cook's distance is another measure of, of influence. So we identify outliers using this plot. Then we start looking at, at the final plot, which is uh, the added variable plot. So added variable plot quantifies the relationship between, two, between a dependent variable and one independent variable at a time. And this plot is interesting. It tells us uh, it plots education that is the focal independent variable, regressed on the other independent variables here, the others, and it takes the residual. So this is the part of, the educa of, of education that is not explained by income or share of women. So that's uh, if you think about the Venn diagram presentation of regression analysis, this is the part of the, the education that does not overlap with any of the other independent variables. Then we have prestige, the regression of prestige on other independent variables and we take the residual. So we take what is unique of prestige and unique of education after parceling out the influence of all other variables in the model. And then we draw a line through that data. 
And this is actually uh, the regression line of education, of prestige on education. So this uh, one way to calculate the regression line is to regress both variables independent and dependent on all other independent variables and then run a regression analysis using just one independent variable. It produces you the exact same result as would producing in including this education with all of the other variables directly in multiple regression analysis. This plot allows us to look for nonlinearities and heteroscedasticity in a more refined manner. So uh, what we can identify from here is that uh, the effects of, of income look pretty weird. We want to have observations that are banded as a band around the regression line and here we can see that it it's looks more like a, a bit of a curve so it goes up here and then flattens out a bit and we also have much more this person here than, than this person here. Now we have done the diagnostic so we did uh, the normal QQ plot then we did uh, the residual versus fit that plot we did the uh, influence plot or the outlier plot and added variable plot and now we have to decide what do, what do we want to do with the model and some ideas that we could try is to uh, use heteroscedasticity robust standard errors. Our sample size is so small and there is no clear evidence of a serious heteroscedasticity problem. So in this case I would probably use the normal uh, conventional standard errors. Consider dropping general managers and see if the results change. Even if we decide to keep general managers in our sample that could work as a robustness check in the paper. So in the deep houses paper they estimated the same model with the one outlier observation and without the outlier and then compare the results. And uh, we should consider log transformation of income. Considering income in relative term terms uh, makes a lot more sense anyway because when you think of uh, races for example or you want to uh, switch to a new job then uh, you typically want to negotiate a salary increase uh, relative to your current level. Also additional salary, uh, how much it um, increases your quality of life depends on the current salary, salary level. So if you give a thousand euros to somebody who makes a thousand euros per month that's a big difference. If you give a thousand euros to somebody who makes uh, five thousand euros a month it's a smaller difference. So uh, income, company revenues, that kind of quantities we typically want to consider in relative terms and to do that we use the log transformation.